morning, Calvary Church. It's so good to see you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is a special day because we are celebrating with 24 incredible individuals who are going public with their faith today. This is the best. So let's stand in worship and let's celebrate them as they enter into new life today. Hey. to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I tried with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I Yeah. 
I cannot deny what I've seen Got no choice but to believe My doubts are burning Oh, like ashes in the wind So, so long to my old friends Burning in bitterness So you can just keep moving No, you ain't welcome here
93 people in the house today. Let's give God praise. Let's bless his name. The Bible says, give thanks in all circumstances. That means the good seasons of fruitfulness. That means the difficult seasons of pain and discouragement. It is a decision that we get to make every day to say thank you, God, because I know on the other side of this, you are working something out that I can't explain, that I can't begin to imagine, but I know that it is for my good. Those in the room, those online, if there is a prayer need that you have that you are carrying into tonight, we want you to know that this is a house of prayer and that we want to partner with you. And so right where you're at, if you could raise your hand or online, let us know what it is in the comments section. Right here in this moment, we want to pray for you. Family, if you see somebody with their hand raised, just extend it to them. Let's be the church. Let's ask God to move on their behalf today. We lift our voices and we say, Father, we thank you. We're believing you for the impossible. We believe, God, that you are reconciling relationships, that you are bringing back to yourself people who are far away. I thank you, God, that you are going to open doors this week, that you are going to give job opportunities, that you are going to give good news, Father. I thank you, Lord, that no weapon of the enemy will prosper today. I thank you that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and who are called according to your purpose. I thank you, Father, that people will begin to see answers to the dreams that you have put on their hearts for years. And I thank you that you are even going to birth dreams this weekend. Father, help us not to put you in a box, but to believe you for even greater, impossible things. We know that, God, we are so limited, but, Lord, nothing is impossible for you today. And we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness, God. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is, yes, great.
devoted like a ring of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old and your love is enduring through the winter and beyond the horizon with mercy for today yourself to me and that's why I sing your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my lips ever be on my lips your praise will ever be on my to the Father.
Can we raise our hands and give God glory this morning? God, we worship you, we honor you, we bless you. You're worthy of it all, God. You're worthy. You're worthy, Jesus. Hey, it is so good to see you. It is so good to worship with you this morning. Hey, if you're comfortable, can you give someone beside you a fist bump or wave to them? Let them know you're glad to see them this morning, and then you guys can have a seat here at Calvary. Hey, if you're joining us online, a special welcome to you. We are so glad that you're here with us this morning. If I haven't had the privilege to meet you yet, my name's Michael, and maybe this is your very first time here. We want you to know here at Calvary, we want people to know God, find freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. And so we're so glad you're here. If this is your first time, or maybe you've been coming for the past several weeks, we want you to know you are officially our guest. And we would love for you to take a next step. If you could pull out your cell phone right now and text the word CC guest to the number 94,000. CC guest 94,000. We'll send you a link. And then we want to mail you a Starbucks gift card. This is just our way of saying thank you for being here at Calvary Church this morning. Calvary family, can we welcome our guests and let them know how glad we are that they're here today? All right, guys, how many of you want to go to Hawaii? Anyone in here besides me want to go to Hawaii? All right, man. We could fill a couple of planes up. Hey, I wish I could pay for all of us to go first class, Hawaii, all inclusive, but I can't. But check it out. This Friday, ladies, we are having a luau um, for our women of Calvary Church. And all everyone's welcome. If you're 10 years old and younger, it's actually free. Okay, but all the other ladies, we want you to know tickets are $15. It's going to be on Friday at 630. We're going to have a flamethrowers. We're going to have a hula contest. We're going to limbo to see how low can you go. Okay, we're in church. We won't do that right now. But we want you to be there, okay? Friday, 6.30, ladies, mark your calendar. All the information's on our website, on our church app. You can find it there. We would love to see you there on Friday. And then Revival's coming up. How many of you are excited for Revival? Awaken. Hey, Revival is August the 11th through the 15th, okay? And if you can't make it every night, that's totally fine. There's no shame. There's no shade. Okay, we want you to come, though, whatever night you can. Mark it on your calendar. It's going to be incredible. We've got some incredible speakers coming. Worship. We're going to have some powerful prayer times together. We're going to believe God for miracles and signs and wonders. So you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a great time. August the 11th through the 15th. Please mark your calendars and be there with us for revival. And then Calvary family, I want to say thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving because of your generosity. Hey, wasn't that awesome, all the baptisms we just saw? 25 people. That's because you give. Every time you give, you're investing in someone's life, transforming and being changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So thank you for putting God first in your finances, whether it's online, through the church app, here in the room. We have giving boxes at every one of our entrances. You can place your offerings there. But I just want to say thank you so much for putting God first and continuing to honor him in worship with your finances. And then finally, we're continuing our series called I Love my, I love my church. I'm so glad you love your church. I love my church. And we actually this morning get to hear from Tanya, a close friend of ours, and about how much she loves Calvary Church. Let's check it out together. 2020 was a challenge because uh, with, with COVID, it definitely sparked a lot of debate. There was a lot of tension. You know, people didn't know what to do. There was confusion. You didn't even feel like the church had the answers. When I look back, I definitely felt that there was a void. I was missing from the church. You know, maybe the church couldn't connect um, due to, you know, this novelty that was happening in our lifetime. I found Calvary by way of Financial Peace University. Not only was I learning things about uh, my finances, but I was learning about how God wanted me to be more like Jesus. I made a decision to join. It was really fulfilling to be a part of a church community that was doing so much and things that I could get involved with. There were some rocky times, of course, too, where I know that my faith was being tested. My first cousin uh, was killed in a tragic car accident. Upon hearing of my cousin's death, a family friend committed suicide. 
and I had not experienced um, that level of loss. And I broke down. I still had some struggles, uh, but I, I was growing in Christ and staying connected with my church made such a difference. The next year, I was able to purchase a home. Bob and Sue Emler came over along with you know, more than 20 people from the church and my family to do a home blessing. And I was super excited about having more fellowship in my home. And then boom, COVID hit and changed, <laughs> changed everything about that plan. And then shortly after that, I lost my sister. She was on dialysis for 20 years and she had a kidney transplant and then it failed her. So she, she couldn't use the kidney anymore. So she was a fighter and we prayed a lot together. And I would read the Bible with her and I would talk to her about God and we would you know, say that we, we were gonna make some plans together. And I invited her to church and we would listen to lots of Christian music together. I missed her dearly. The greeters at Calvary sent me these loving messages and they called me and sent me flowers. They prayed for me and they helped me to get through a very dark time. I'm truly grateful for those that I can call my family in Christ. I have a different understanding of what it means to, to love people the way that you know Jesus first loved us. Even though we were apart and we went through some darker times and some dim times, we are like coming together stronger and, and better and we will be able to fulfill the things that God has for us. Come on, how cool was that, Calvary Church? Well, good morning, Calvary. Are you glad to be in God's house today? Come on, let's just celebrate the Lord this morning. How about a big hand for all the folks watching online? Online crowds, so good to have you guys with us today as well. Before we do our Bible proclamation, let me give you a heads up on something significant here in just uh, two weeks from this weekend. We are doing, first time ever in our church, a full weekend, all of our services about back to school blessing. And here's what's going to happen. We want to bring everybody to the church that weekend, kids, faculty, anybody who is part of academics, college, high school, junior high, elementary, Calvary Christian School, public school, everybody. And we're going to gear the entire service around blessing our students and our faculty and asking God to give them a prosperous and productive and protected year. And so be here, back to school blessing weekend. Uh, everybody's welcome to the house. We're going to preach a sermon that weekend about blessing and so forth. And I want the church to be seen as a help and a source of encouragement in our world today. And let's pray for our teachers, pray for our students, let's pray for our schools that God may be glorified. Can I get somebody in the house today to come on, give God a praise for that thought? Yes. All right, get up on your feet, get your Bible out. Hold your Bible up high. This is our proclamation. Say it loud. Say it clear. Say it with me. Come on. One, two, three. This is my Bible, the inspired, inerrant, infallible, eternal word of God. All scripture is God-given and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. I declare that my mind is alert. My heart is receptive, and today I will be transformed by the Word of God. Come on, give God today a praise for his book that's about to change your life. Take your seat. Uh, as a bit of a warning, we're going to be in a lot of Scripture today, so please, uh, I hope you have your Bible on uh, ready-to-flip mode, okay? Because lots of stuff coming up. We're going to kick off in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is in the New Testament side of Scripture. And we're going to talk today about what I just simply call the missing church. If you've lived on the earth for any amount of time in the church or out of the church, you've heard about 
the end of time, or maybe an event we call the rapture. Have you heard about the rapture before? Put your hand up high. Anybody ever heard about that? Yeah, most of us have, or a, a, an ending of things. And so we talk about this, and by the way, the rapture is a separate event from the second coming, and that's when he comes with his church back to the earth. So this is a different conversation, so listen close today. And what's unique is, is that every generation often thinks about the rapture in light of their generation. Many people, my grandparents who are already gone to heaven, they believed they would see the rapture of the church. They, they believed they would live on this earth and not die, but they would be one day raptured up into the sky with Jesus. And I think it's important to live that way because none of us know the day or the hour. In fact, if anybody ever tells you that they know when he's coming back, then they just lie because Jesus himself said, no one knows the day or the hour, right? So in that thought process, it's unique because as I watch culture, we tend to associate certain events in this life with the rapture. And we often, we even use the phrase, you know, beam me up, Jesus. Get me out of here now. So we often look at things like wars or acts of nature or terror, diluting of the Bible, which we see rampant today. Government being overly involved with our life, we tend to think about that as a precursor to the rapture taking place. Technology. Um, even every time we elect a president, Ever since I've been voting as an American, every four years I hear this statement, if that person gets elected, then Jesus is coming soon. Have you ever heard that before? Who's ever heard, come on, who's ever heard that before? Let me just help all of us today. There is not a connection between the U.S. elections and the rapture. I'm just going to help you with that, and let's move on past that, because I know for some of you, you're convinced if so-and-so gets in, and that means surely Jesus is coming soon. There's not a button in heaven in which God is sitting by and he waits for November election to come and goes, should I push it now or later? It doesn't work that way. And so we often have this thought going on in our minds about what's going to take place. And even conspiracies tend to trigger this thought of, of process for us as Christ followers. And today, I hope you'll hear this, but I hope you'll leave here different than you showed up. The Bible is about a third prophecy, and most of that relates to this conversation. And so I believe, and if you differ with this, that's fine. If anything I say today you differ with as far as eschatology-wise, no need to email me. I'm not going to answer you. Because there's so much here that can just debate back and forth. It doesn't glorify God. That's not my heart today. My heart today is to get his church, his local church, ready for the rapture. And that's my focus. So I believe that the next big event on the prophetic timeline in Scripture is the rapture of the church. I think that's what's next. Go real fast to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, or 4, excuse me, and go to verse 13. But I don't want you to be ignorant. Everybody say ignorant. ignorant. Who would like to not be ignorant? Only about half of you. <laughs> well, the rest of you are content to be ignorant, I guess. Who would like to not be ignorant? Come on, yeah, I'm with you right there. Concerning those who fall asleep, let you sorrows of those who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the Lord of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain will be, until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a what? With a what? With a what? With a what? Shout. There you go. With the shout. <laughs> you can't say shout quietly. Come on, shout. shout. There you go. Yeah. Whoa. With the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Not on the earth, in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Two words, I think, in this text. You just kind of center off for a second this morning. Uh, first, the word ignorant. Uh, don't be uninformed. Don't be misinformed about the end of time or his return. Don't listen to the wrong stuff. Hear the right stuff. 
rightly divide the word of truth and make sure you know what's going to take place and live your life that way, but also live with comfort. No Christ follower should ever be concerned about the return of Jesus Christ nor death itself. What's unique to me is that many people, their greatest fear is of what? Dying. And I don't understand that because we know that when you're in Christ, you never really die. This temporal body fades away, but you have not ceased to exist. You simply go on to eternity with Jesus Christ, and you are as alive as you've ever been in your entire life. you got the perfect age, perfect body. Everybody looks like the Bowflex guy when you get to heaven. So why do we fear that? Why do we fear the rapture? Why do people live in angst of this? And and why do we tend to stock up extra boxes of Twinkies and bottled water? You know, we are, we're made for another life. We're, We're built for eternity. We are built not for this temporal and sin-filled and broken and and unhealthy and difficult culture. We are built to be in the presence of the Almighty God and to worship and to celebrate and to experience Him and enjoy Him. That's what we're built for. So we should never fear death or even fear any talk about the end of time because we have information, therefore we are no longer ignorant. I would like to not be ignorant in my life. Look at the words of Jesus. Go to Luke 17 real fast. Again, lots of flipping today. Luke 17, 31. In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house... Let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who is in the field, let him not turn back. And then Jesus said this. He said, remember Lot's wife. Now, just think about that. We'll come back to that in just a second. Remember Lot's wife. What do we know about Lot's wife? Well, we simply know that she looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. But she looked back. Why? Because she loved what she was leaving more than where she was going. Let's just think about this. Before Jesus establishes his kingdom on the earth, he will come for his church in this amazing event that we call the rapture. At that time, the dead in Christ will be raised from the dead. They will rise up. And in the moment of resurrection, they will have a glorified body that meets them and they meet him in the air. He's coming back in the sky, parting back the clouds. He will be there. And those who are dead in Christ, they will rise up first, have that glorified body. And if that day you're shopping at Costco and walking down aisle 17, you're going to all of a sudden be taken out, leaving your stuff behind. You won't need it any longer. Your cart will be sitting there in aisle 17 and you'll be taken to meet him with a glorified body as well in the air. Now, this is important because I want you to think for a moment about what's going to happen when the church goes missing. Just just for a minute, if you could process it, think about what's going to happen that day when all of a sudden... Millions of people from all over the globe are taken up. He, he, he's not going to do it based on time zones. <laughs> it's not going to be like watching the ball drop on New Year's Eve. It's going to happen just like that. And for some, it'll happen at midnight. For some, it'll happen at noon. For some, it'll happen at 2 a.m. For some, it'll happen at 2 p.m. It's going to happen just like that. And from all over the globe, every nation, every tribe, every tongue is going to come up off the ground or out of the grave to be with Jesus in the air. What a glorious day that's going to be. But just think about on this side of it, if you're one of the people still here on the earth, what's that going to look like? Let me just throw this out here without getting off on any kind of a tangent at all. Please hear me say that as a precursor. We've seen this past year, the first time in my lifetime, the church shut down. 
as far as physically meeting together. And I'm not pushing on that conversation. I'm simply just going to bring to you a, a thought process to think about. Just think about what we saw in the world when the church closed. And I, I don't even have the bandwidth to have the discussion with folks to go, well, the church was finally the church. We got to go be the church. Well, I'm all for that. I'm glad we were doing that, and we should always do that. But we should do that because God said that, not because the governor said that. And I've been preaching my whole ministry, let's go be the church in the highways and byways, go to your neighborhood. I'm all for that, and we should still be doing that, but we should still be gathering together as the body of Christ. And so just think about this real fast. Think about what we saw in the world to, uh, this past year where the church shut down. The world didn't get better. The world got worse. And I just want to throw at you the idea that when the church is raptured up, things aren't going to be better here. They're going to be tough here. And that's why you want to be part of the rapture conversation. Now, I believe, and this is my position, again, if you differ theologically, that's fine. Study your Bible, but don't email me. I'm not going to answer. I believe that the rapture will take the church up prior to the tribulation, which is a great period of judgment upon the earth, a difficult period. Now, if you think different and you want to go through tribulation, then that's your decision. If, if you think I'm wrong, when you find out I'm right on the way to heaven, you could say, I'm sorry, you were right and I was wrong, and I'll forgive you. But I, I just want to lean today the conversation toward this phrase, the missing church. Or I could even pivot and call it missing the church. Let's go to Luke 17 real fast. Look again back at the words of Jesus Christ. Luke 17, verse 24. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part of heaven under shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day like lightning flash. But first, he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, now here's Noah coming in the conversation. We've heard Lot's wife, now we're looking at Noah. So it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given to marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, now we see Lot. We have Lot's wife, we have Noah, now we have Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built, but on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, what's unique to me is we have three different names in the conversation right now about giving us a picture of what that day will be like. And the last two being Noah and Lot give us some insight again into the idea that the church is taken up before the tribulation, they are, they are safe from the wrath. They don't go in the wrath. And you might say, well, Marty, Noah floated in the flood. Yes, but he floated above the waters, not under the waters. Just like we're going to float above in the sky with Jesus, not in the difficulty of tribulation time. So I believe that we are definitely talking about a pre-tribulation rapture conversation. If you differ, that's totally fine by me. Please don't email me. But let's think about the days of Noah. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 6. Now let's go to verses 5 through 8. Let's look at the days of Noah. Let's see what those days were like because that's what Jesus just said. He said, as the days of Noah, so will this day be. Let's go here. Genesis 6 verses 5 through 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Watch this close. You never have to wonder, does God see the wickedness? The answer is absolutely yes. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only continually evil. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy him who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now watch verse 8 close. But Noah found what? Grace 
in the eyes of the Lord. Think about this phrase, but Noah found grace. Here's some good news. Even in the midst of wickedness, God is seeking people that he can give grace to. So how did Noah get grace? Two simple things the Bible tells us about the man named Noah. We know that he was a man that walked with God and that he was a just man. I think God's always looking for people who will walk with him and people who will be just in all that they say and do. I think that's the kind of God that we serve. But I'm intrigued by this Noah dialogue. Now go to Matthew 24, back to the words of Jesus again. It says, when the Son of Man returns, some in verse 37, it will be like it was in the days of Noah. Okay. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time that Noah went into his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them away. That is what That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Watch this close because I'm often asked the question when difficult times happen, is this a sign that he's coming soon? And the Bible tells us on multiple fronts here that when Jesus comes back to receive his church, that life will be life as usual. Please don't connect earthly events necessarily to the rapture itself because what we see here in this conversation is that at the time of the rapture, they'll be doing what they've always done. I know last year a lot of people had a hard time processing all the difficulty, all the limited supplies, this being gone. You couldn't access this. And for some of us, the price of steak at Costco was debilitating. And all of a sudden, you look at the price of the T-bone, you're going, oh, come, Lord Jesus, come. And I just want to remind you that that's not how this works because in reality, there are many people across the globe that what we experienced last year for a short season, that is their normal life. And so we want to be careful that we don't get casual about this conversation, but also always realize that when Jesus comes back, the idea is clear that they'll be doing what they've always done. And what's intriguing about this is that in the days of Noah, people were looking right at their only hope. This ark was no small conversation. Noah didn't build the ark in his garage. He didn't build it in a warehouse hidden from public eye. He was building this in a time and space when everyone could see it. And I can guarantee you that Noah was the talk or even the laughing stock of the town. Because here's a guy building a massive boat, a massive ark, a massive ship, and proclaiming that this boat's going to save him and his family and the animals when the flood, when the rains pour and the flood comes. Keep in mind, to that time on the earth, they had never seen rain from heaven yet. So everything about this is making no sense to the person on the outside of God's plan. And here's what's intriguing to me. The only hope they had was sitting right there, but they were too occupied by everything around them and entertaining them to see the one thing that could save them. Now let that simmer for just a second because that's where we come into play. I wonder at times in the body of Christ if we're too occupied by everything around us that we are ignoring the one thing that can save us. And I just want to lean into thought here. And I want to build off this idea of the days of Noah and just remind you, they were drunken on themselves. They were so full of self. They were so full of their own comfort level, their own consumption, that the one thing that they needed and the one place they needed to be, they simply didn't care about and couldn't get to. Today, I want to lean into a thought with you, and please go with me slow today, and please hear my heart, and please, if this next part offends you, then you need it. Modernism and Western theology has done a wonderful job of empowering the thought that separates being a Christ follower and being a churchgoer. And you cannot find that in the scripture. You find it in modern culture. You find it in modern consumerism. You find it in a world that builds their life around around what entertains them. 
and what attracts them and not what they need necessarily. And I realize, and I say this very lovingly, and I say this with a pastor's shepherd heart, and please know this, I know this past year many people were not able to be with us in person because of medical and concerns, and I, I understand that, and they've been faithful online, they've watched every service, They've engaged the staff. They've reached out for prayer. We've had phone calls, and you've done the very best you can. And I celebrate the fact that we have been able to connect via a digital venue. I thank God for that resource in this day and time. I celebrate that. But if you're able to be here, then you need to be here. I know this is church series, and part of what we do in a church series is we kind of have some housekeeping items covered. So this is kind of a housekeeping conversation. And let me say to you this, when I said this in the pandemic, if you can go to Costco, you can go to church, and man, I got the emails for that one. <laughs> I'm going to say it again, if you can go to Costco, you can go to church. <laughs> because my concern right now as a pastor is not that the pandemic empty the church, but the pleasure of this life has kept people out of the church. And it's time to get in the church and be the church. Now you say, why do you say that? You're trying to build a big crowd. Not at all. Not at all. I preached an empty house for 90 days. I'm fine. But I want to make sure that when the sky parts and the Son of Man appears in the clouds, that you go with him in the air. And I, I want to push on the idea that you can be part of the church and not be at the church. Uh, I teach us in married life that the number one thing in married life is go home. It's a whole lot simpler to be married in the same house. I know, that's deep stuff. Somebody going, man, the deep theology right there. I know, it's amazing. I, I'm softening you up for a, a really tough one coming up. I'm trying to get you laughing. Come on, let's just do a courtesy laugh real fast. Come on, just, oh, I'm so glad your heart's so open right now. That's so good. All right, here, let's just listen close. If you're not missing the church right now, what makes you think you'll miss the church when the church goes missing? I'm asking for a friend. Why do people think they can live there? And I know you're thinking, Marty, we're at the church. What are you yelling at us for? I'm not yelling at anybody. I'm, I'm talking to the body of Christ because we tend to always put our message toward folks outside the church. And there's times you've got to hear the message yourself. So why do, why do people think they can live their entire life outside the church and then one day just randomly be raptured into heaven with Jesus. If you don't go to church now, why do you think you're part of the church then? Oh, I know. I'm going to get some emails now. I'm just going just, to just bring them. I'm not answering, but go ahead and bring them anyway. I'm not going to answer you. Because you won't find that in the scripture. What you find in the scripture is house to house. Don't forsake the gathering of the brethren together, especially as the day approaches. And if you believe Jesus is coming soon, then you should have your hide in the house of God. Now, now you missed the clap part right there. I'm a, I'm a simple brain. I really am. I'm not that sharp. I'm a small brain person. I know this. The devil doesn't want people in church. Would you agree with that statement? I know this. God wants his body to get together and worship and glorify him. I believe that. You believe that? Say yes. All right. So I'm not complicated, but for me, if the devil wants something, I don't want what he wants for me. If he wants me out of church, I'm going to go to church just to tick him off if nothing else. If nothing else. 
And if I know God wants me in church, I'm going to go to glorify him because I want to glorify him and make the devil mad. You can summarize my entire life goal by glorifying God and ticking off the devil. What a way to live your life. That's how I choose to make decisions. Let me give you real fast two reasons to be raptured, two reasons why you want to be raptured. Number one, because you want to be with Jesus. That's what it's about. It's about him. Your savior, your deliverer, your king, the son of God, the son of the most high. Shepherd, bread, water, light, he's everything to us. He is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. I want to go to be with Jesus. The second reason is you want to go in the rapture because you want to escape the wrath and judgment of God. Now, please hear me. As believers, we never want to say that with any kind of an arrogance to it. In fact, I would argue that we really hurt hurt the gospel and we hurt the message of the gospel when we're cavalier about the fact that one day he will judge this earth and we do nothing to correct this earth before he comes back. And if you believe that Jesus is coming soon, which he is, then you should be passionate for the Great Commission. And you should be prepared to do anything possible short of sinning itself to get someone to hear the gospel. And you should work tirelessly and endlessly and be be prepared to lay aside every goal and agenda you have for the sake of just the one. Didn't he leave the 99 and go for the one? So we talk about the wrath of God. Please know we don't say that with any sense of casualness to it. It's a horrific day that we should hope no one ever experiences. Even the scripture says he is not wanting for any to perish, but for all to come to what? Repentance. And that should be the cry of every believer. Now, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And here's the sermon. That's the warm-up. Here's the message. While you're turning, let me say this to you. The church is both visible and invisible. It's, It's global. It's local. There's not... There's only one church of Jesus Christ. There's only one body. The body comes in different shapes and sizes. We read this last week and we talked about this last week. We are are different and we're fit together for God's divine purpose and God has different types of bodies. Not every church has the same assignment. Not every church has the same location. Not every church has the same purpose. And every church is unique and it should be because we're unique. And some of us like things this way and some that way. I understand that fully, and I encourage you, make sure you're in the church that God placed you in and God fits you in and use your gifts in because that glorifies him. But the church is the people that he assembles together to worship him and to magnify him and to be taught the word and then to go and do his work in the world as if he were here himself. That's the church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, here we go, verses 1 through 10, quickly, but concerning the times and seasons, brethren, You have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. You've heard that before probably. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them and labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, Christians, church at Thessalonica, Thessaloniki, this you're the people writing, he's writing the letter to, but to you, listen close, are not in darkness. So that this day should not overtake you as a thief. We should not be surprised by his return. You are all sons of light. You're sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are in the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now watch verse 9 again, another verse why I think we are raptured before the tribulation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. I'm going to give you real fast today, and this is the message. That was the warm-up. Here's the sermon, just a few minutes long. Here we go. Four things that make you rapture ready. Are you ready? Say yes. Number one, everybody say wake up. Wake up. 
too many people today are asleep. They're asleep in the church. Let me give you one example of that. When you hear the word and don't do the word, that's because you're sleeping through the word. Have you ever tried to talk to somebody and they're asleep and they don't hear what you say? Happens to me almost every week. <laughs> All the time. We got to wake up. Look at you never say wake up. Now, let me say this to you. If you need to go to sleep physically and you're in church, if, you're, if, if I'm preaching and it's not clicking with you, that's fine by me. And you just go to sleep, don't, don't bob your head. And, and, and just look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, can I lay my head on your shoulder? And then just ease on over. Because if you're bobbing, we all know what's going on. Just lay down and take a nap. But too many people are asleep in the church. They, they, they come to church, they do the deed, they cross the T's and they dot the I's, but nothing really changes and they are spiritually lethargic. They have eaten way too much sugar and not enough protein, not enough meat, and too much fluff. And I want to encourage you to wake up. Everybody say, wake up. Yeah. Look at your neighbor and say, wake up. Yeah. Look back and say, you're the one snoring. <laughs> Number two... You live rapture ready when you start to look up. Everybody say, look up. You know how we look up? Because Jesus is there. See, our world, everything about our world says, look to the right, look to the left, look who's ahead of you, look who's behind you. Keep up with the Smiths and the Joneses and the whoever else's. But you know what we got to do? Forget what's around you. Forget who's behind you. Forget who's beside you. And let's begin to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who is sitting right now at the right hand of the Father in heaven, who's interceding for us, who's praying for us. Let's set our eyes upon Jesus. Set our hearts upon heaven. Set our mind upon heaven. Let's live our life looking up. Forget to the right. Forget to the left. And let's look unto Jesus in every part of our life. Start living with him as your goal. Start living with him as the one you're looking to. Everybody say, wake up. Everybody say, look up. Number three, everybody say, sober up. You know what that word means? Some of you literally sober up. You know what that word means? It means to be clear-headed. I'm going to help you real fast, and this is for free. This doesn't cost you anything. What I'm about to say is free of charge. If you're spending more time watching the news or reading social platform feeds than you are the Word of God, then you are already foggy headed. You're scared to say amen because you know you just condemned yourself. <laughs> I'm going to challenge you take one week of your life and spend more time in this book than Facebook. Spend more time with the good news than you do with Fox or CNN or whoever else you watch. Spend more time talking about Jesus than you do with politics. Spend more time talking about the healer than you do the virus. Spend more time talking about the provider than you do how broke you are. Spend more time talking about the miracle that God has for your life than you do the difficulty you have. I know we have tribulation, but the Apostle Paul said that this is light tribulation and does not compare to the eternal weight of glory that God has for us. Let's start looking up. Let's wake up. Let's sober up and let's get clear-headed and let's get Get rapture ready. We have a savior. We have a deliverer who is coming soon to receive his church, and I want to go one day. Number four. This is it. Everybody say, wake up. Everybody say, look up. Everybody say, sober up. Here's number four. You ready? Suit up. When I go to the beach, I wear beach clothes. When I go hunting, I wear hunting clothes. When I go to the gym, I wear gym clothes. When it's January in Chicago, I wear winter clothes. 
When it's July in Chicago, I don't wear winter clothes. What's my point? You can tell by how I'm dressed where I'm going. And church, I want to tell you, it's time to get dressed. You know why we have Tuesday night prayer at Calvary Church? Not to take another hour of your week, but that's the service that we engage warfare. And in the scripture, the only imagery you see for the Christian When it comes to attire, two things primarily. One is put on Christ, and the second is put on the full armor of God. Why does the Scripture give us the imagery of a soldier's attire if the Christian life is a beach? Why does the Scripture give us the imagery of a soldier's attire if the Christian life is like going shopping at Costco? Why does the Scripture give us the image of a soldier? You know why? Because we are in a spiritual conflict of good and evil, and it's time to suit up. It's time to look up. It's time to sober up. It's time to wake up and be victorious with the power of Jesus Christ. It's time to get your sword, get your shield, get your chest covered, get your feet covered, get your belt on, get your helmet on. It's time to fight. It's time to be victorious. It's time to win. It's time to kick the devil's tail. It's time to seize the victory that God has for us. It's time to live rapture ready. We serve a God who wants to redeem his church. We serve a Savior who's coming for his bride, who is washed by the blood of the Lamb. It is time to suit up and be victorious in the body of Christ. Get up on your feet. We're going to worship him today. We're going to worship a Savior today who loves us. Look unto heaven and let's lift our voice. Come on, raise your voice to worship God today. We set our hope on you. We set our hope on your love. We set our hope on the now let's look up to heaven come on lift your hands across this place you're watching online let's look up right now lift your hands as high as you can look up look up look up look up look up our redemption draw nigh Jesus is coming soon to receive his church it is our hope it's our passion it's our everything we long for that day come Lord Jesus come quickly but we'll occupy do you come we'll come and Be ready when you come, and we're going to work the work you've sent us to do till we receive that calling. Maybe today you're in the house, you say, Marty, man, this dialogue about the end times and the rapture scares me because I'm not sure if I'm ready just yet. Well, today you can fix that right now. In a moment, I'm going to give you the chance to make certain that when that trumpet sounds, when that shout comes forth, And when that sky rolls back, you will be ready to go meet your Savior in the air. 
Don't leave here today with any sense of concern for that. Leave here today with the confidence that he is your savior. In a moment, I'm gonna count to three, real simple, just quick like that. And when I hit three, put your hand as high as you can and leave here today having said a prayer of faith and knowing that Jesus has forgiven your sin and given you the eternal hope that only he can offer to you today. You say, Marty, I don't want to raise my hand in a room like this. Folks will think I'm strange. Not at all. We've been praying for this. This is your moment. We're cheering for you even right now. We're here to celebrate your choice today because this is why we do what we do. Everything is about this moment today. You can leave here today with the full confidence that Jesus is your Savior. When I count the three, don't be slow, don't be shy, don't be ashamed. Leave here today knowing that your sins are washed away. Eternal hope in Christ is yours, and you can look up and be ready for that day. When I hit three, put your hand as high as you can. If you guys can, bring the lights across the house up a bit so I can see hands better off. When I hit three, just put your hand as high as you can. One, two, three, hand in the air real fast. Who today? Keep your hand up, keep your hand up. One, two, three, four, keep your hand up. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, Keep your hand up, keep your hand up. 11, 12, 13, 14, keep your hand up. 15, 16, 17, 18, keep your hand up. 19, keep your hand up high. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. Keep your hand up high. Come on, anybody else? 32, anybody else today? Come on, let's just thank God for 32 hands raised today across this room. That's what I saw. There may have been more. If you're watching online, I cannot see you, but God can see you. And today we're gonna to pray a very simple prayer of faith with you online and in the house. And if you should have put your hand up, but you did not, the prayer is what makes a difference. So you can still pray the prayer and the prayer does the work, not the hand, but right? It's just a connection point. You say, Marty, why do you, why do you count hands? Well, real simple, every number has a name. Every name has a story, and every story matters to God. And I want you to know today that you matter to God. And I've had you put your hand up so you can feel some sense of value in this momentary exchange that we've been praying for you, and you're why we're here today. You're why we showed up today. This is the reason we come to the house of God is this moment right here. So I'm gonna pray with you right now, very simple prayer of faith. If you're online, again, I can't see your hand, but God can see your hand today, and you pray with us, okay? Are you ready to pray, church? Say yes. Come on, say, Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus to be my Savior. Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. I confess that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And today I announce you as the risen Son of God, my Savior, and my Lord. In your name I pray, amen. Come on, give God a big hand today for saving grace. If you pray that prayer today and you're in the house, I wanna ask you to do one more thing for us, and that is when we dismiss the room today, go out these center doors where there's an area just through the foyer that has a big sign that says, I have decided. Stop by there, talk to our staff. We're not gonna market you or press you, but we wanna make sure you have a Bible, someone to pray with you, know what's next in your life's journey. We wanna help you get on the right path so you can serve God the rest of your days. If you're online today and cannot be here, text the number on the screen right now. We wanna connect with you as well. Same purpose, same, same passion to be connected to you and to help you on life's journey. We're here for you and we're cheering for you. I'm doing my math real fast, 34, 19, so 50, 40, See, 1934, 53, plus four last night, 57 hands this weekend at Calvary Church. Praise God. All right. I'm going to bless you, dismiss you. If you want prayer, the altars are yours. Come. Our staff will be here today to pray with you. We love you very much. So if you want a blessing or prayer at the altar, after the blessing, come forward, okay? Hand up high, may the Lord bless and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his love surround you. May his grace flow through you. And may you never forget to live your life looking up, for Jesus is coming soon. 
I love you guys. God bless you. Been a great crowd. We'll see you back here soon. God bless you. Have a good day.